is it capture or kill or is it <laughs> I mean like I, what, yeah. what's what's I, on paper versus I, what's in your head? Um what's yeah, what's What's on paper will say capture kill. Uh, I won't speak for the whole assault force. What's what's in my head is uh, kill as many terrorists as we can that night. <laughs> we did one time. We did an episode <laughs> yes. like ten minutes yes. in, and then she saw it, and I, then she did. You could tell she it. was like, <laughs> "Yeah, oh man, uh, I am." I uh, I tell people all the time, especially you know with, with CQB or you know yeah I was a you know sniper for the last five years of my adult force career. The people get in front of me, and sometimes like in a training environment, they're like you know I, like they don't want to make a mistake in front of the adult force yeah. guy. And I'm like, man, if you had any idea how many mistakes I've made, you know, I say, but this is this is my rule about mistakes. Just don't make the same mistake twice. Mm-hmm. Like make a mistake, like I get it out of the way, you know. But my, but just don't make the same mistake twice. And uh, unfortunately, I, I was, I'm even really creative with the amount of first mistakes I can make, <laughs> but I don't, I don't make them twice. Okay, cool. Well, we got Brent Tucker here. He's a founder and CEO of First Responders Coffee Company, and he drove all the way here to be with us. So, um, I guess I was just gonna start with your background because I know you you flow grown, so and the, yes. the pri- prior military. Yes, and then military, and then eventually, you know, I really want to hear about your coffee company. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, um, Florida grown. Uh, we, my family's been in Florida for a long time. I'm a ninth generation Floridian. Um, the, That's like uh, Saint Augustine. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my grandfather used to make the joke because uh, people were kind of impressed by that. He's like, well, you know, back then there were only two types of people in Florida: Indians and horse thieves, and and we're not Indians. <laughs> So, so I don't, I don't know if it's impressive to be here, uh, that long, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, after nine 11, I, I joined the military. Um, we'll get into, you know, that, but you know, t- 20 years later, you know, first thing I did when, uh, as soon as I retired is come back here to Florida and, and, and be with family. What did you want to do prior to nine 11? Like it, it was a military huh. thing. You, you want to talk about a, 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 a different story that, that would have been told. No, no one would invite me on a podcast had my uh, my original plan <laughs> worked out. Uh, I worked at a, a farm and garden center, Tucker's Farm and Garden Center. Speaking of my grandfather, he started it in 1972, uh, and my dad owned it. And uh, I, my only plan in life was to work in that little feed store and carry on the family business. And it's all I wanted to do. So had 9-11 not happened, I would still be working in a feed store right now in Sanford, Florida, Happy as can be. Yeah. Um, and it's ironic because all, all, all my friends wanted to get out of Sanford and, uh, and all I wanted to do was stay in Sanford and most of them are still there and I'm the one that got out and I didn't even want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> I love, I love Florida. <laughs> I moved here from the North and I always said it feels like it's like a, like a trashier California, like a more conservative. <laughs> I love the weather. I love the people yeah. and you know, you can definitely tell a Florida transplant from a Floridian that was born and raised, but you know, I came here for college and you know, I, she wants to leave. She wants to go somewhere West, like Texas or something cold. I Northwest. Northwest. Okay. Yeah. But well, I, you know what, uh, I, as, as a kid, you know, there's still a whole lot of people moving here, but even in the eighties there are plenty of New Yorkers, you know, moving down to Florida. And I do remember my dad, uh, I mean, like, you know, Saying, you know, not being real happy about it. I'm like, Dad, what, what's what's what is your problem? But I will tell you this: in uh, in my 40s, I uh, I do feel a lot more like my dad, and I love Florida, and anyone is welcome to come here. But if you came here because your state sucks, yeah, quit act, quit carrying the political views and mindset of the of the state you left that sucks. Yeah, don't California, my Florida. <laughs> it's one. It's one. Of my, it's one of my favorite shirts. <laughs> It's one of my favorite shirts. Don't New York, my Florida. Don't California, my Florida. So if you came here to escape your your trashy state that overtaxes you, leave that mindset yeah. there. But they I, don't, and that's the problem. That's why I, th- I think Texas is going through that. Yeah. Everybody yes, loved, 10 years ago, everybody loved being from Texas. And now it's kind of like, oh, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's, and it's not um, I'm just speaking facts, and, and it's not just Americans that do it. Um, you know, there's people you know who leave their country to come to this country because because it's better. And they will mm-hmm. tell you this is why 
I, I left, you know, there's more opportunity here. It's safer to raise a family, you know, litany of reasons that, that, that I hope and believe are true. And then they're not proud of the country that they're more proud of the country they came from than the ones yes. that they live in. I just had my I buddy. I have a problem with that. And my buddy Diogo, come on. He came from Brazil in like 2013, him and his wife. He had a, he was a um, small business owner in Brazil and yeah. he's like, I want to join. He was in the Brazilian army, which is mandated. Okay. Then he got out and then he's like, I want to join. He wanted, his original goal was special forces. And so mm-hmm. he came to America, somehow moved to LA, um, didn't speak a lick of English. His <laughs> wife had to do all the translating yeah. for him. Then he went to started going to recruiters and every branch was like, you don't think he didn't speak any English. And uh, yeah. he eventually said the army found a waiver for me. And yeah. even at MEPS on his, when he was shipping out, they were like, everybody was like, what? And <laughs> he got in and he learned English. He got a citizenship and you know, he loves it. I love know. it. And that's, that's the way the story should be. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. You know, it's, uh, there are so many ways to come here and, and to do it right. And when people do it, I love it. It's a great story. Yeah. But yes, yeah, speaking of All right. former podcasts, I watched the one. Um, I want to say it was. Were, I think you might have been one. It was at least one, if not two. Where you talked about how you started your military career, and it was not when you kind of like realized by yourself, like, okay, I wanted to join, but this wasn't it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, so, uh, like I said, my uh, my background was just being a feed store. You know, it's not. You know, we were a very pro American family. Um, my dad used to take me to air shows. I could name every every fighter jet and you know, attack aircraft and in, in the inventory. Um, but, uh, you know, but joining the military and much less the army was definitely not in the cards and, and until it was. So after nine 11, um, when I joined, I mean, it's just a classic case of going to a recruiter and be like, Hey, uh, what, do, what do you, what do you guys need? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm here and them having to fill a spot, you know? Yeah. Um, and the spot they filled was air defense um, and obviously like looking back, it's, it's, it's blatant that you know, not a whole lot of Taliban aircraft were needed to be shot down, uh, in 2001. Yeah. That was the job they put me in. Did you express anything of where you wanted to go of interest or did you just say, Hey, army just that? Yeah. I just knew army was, you know, was on the ground and you know, they, you know, I'd probably, probably see some action. Um, or, you know, hopefully I knew I didn't want to go to the Navy, uh, for, you know, because, in my mind, you know, I knew it was yeah, no flying is going to, you know, well, flying is going to take forever. You know, you know, that's a whole, you know, that's a whole thing you have to start years and years from. And because if, special operations wasn't in your mindset right now. Currently. No, it was just not, getting in the military. Not at all. Okay. Absolutely not. It wasn't even, uh, you know, it didn't even cross my mind to go anything special operations. Um, so yeah, I mean, none of the other services seem to be, you know, in the action right away. I thought the army would put me in the action right away. Wrong. Um, so, uh, you know, so by the time I get to my unit, like mid or early 2002, some guys had come back from the first deployment and, you know, I was all excited, naive, like, man, how was it? How's Afghanistan? You know, is there still fighting going on? What's going on? And like, we didn't do anything. What are you talking about? Like we're in air defense, Brent. Like we guarded gates and did all the jobs no one else wanted to do. And it just, it, it hurt my heart. I was like, no, this is not why Mm -hmm. I left my family business. Why I left my hometown. Is this National Guard? It was a National Guard unit. Yeah. Is that the Daytona one? Yes. Yep. It sure was. I I suited. Did they know that you were there at one point? I suited with them once when I left college. When I left from North Carolina to college, I was in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just found, I went to Daytona Beach for college and I was like, hey guys, can I just, can you? Yeah, they were like, well, "Yeah, you can come hang out with us." Oh man, if I can dig in the memory banks, I think f- Charlie Battery first of the two sixty fifth. Man, I don't know. My little brother and here, here's a uh, and actually, when I joined, I was too scared to join by myself. Um, I wanted to. Um, I went and dragged my little brother into the military with me. Really, he was seventeen at the time. My parents had to sign him in. Um, Wow. And so me and him joined together. Um, this was our first unit to basic AIT, you know, we're this unit together. Um, the, uh, that unit mobilized for the invasion of Iraq. And then we demobilized, uh, pretty quick. 
and that was that was the the final straw for me after knowing guys had deployed and then we spun up for Iraq and then you know and then demobilized and I was like man I got to I got to go somewhere else no you, we're, no one's I'm not going to shoot anyone in the face here so you when you reached out and you got the opportunity I don't want to speak for you I have like I have like so many like detailed questions I want to ask like did they let you jump in in uh, an OSA at the tail end, or did you have to go through, like, did, I'm assuming you had to do the infantry OSA at some no, point? No, no, I, I didn't. Um, and here's uh, um, similar to a story we, we talked about before the podcast. It's That's actually an old card of mine bugging people when I, when I want something, I, when there's something I want. Do you remember the AKO white pages? Do you remember AKO? Yeah, yeah. Uh, knowledge uh, online? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I started kind of letting a few people, you know, close to me in my unit know that I wanted to go, you know, you know, that I wanted to go special forces. And uh, it was just a mythical thing for a National Guard guy to want to be a Green Beret, you know, and they're like, nope, can't do it. Like just these crazy stories. Like, you know, you have one, you, know, you have to be an E5. And I know in hindsight, I know why they think that, but it's not true. Mm-hmm. Um, other guys like you already, you know, you know, you can't, you can't have tattoos, like, you know, all sorts of, like ridiculous things that just aren't true. Um, and then, uh, I eventually went to the AK white pages and Googled special forces and found a, a random, um, a random special forces recruiter, uh, through that. And I called him and, uh, I still remember his name, Carrie, uh, Kurt Carey. And he picked up the phone. I told him, Hey, uh, this is private first class Tucker. Uh, I want to be a green beret and, um, was literally, I told him, uh, that, conversation lasted maybe 30 seconds more than that and uh told me um basically told me to uh, call back call back when i'm a, a specialist at least um <laughs> and that is true you have to be a specialist okay uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and ironically enough the way he could care less about about who i was wanted me just drove me crazy wanted me to uh, yeah i couldn't wait to be a specialist and prove that guy wrong yeah uh even even harder Wow. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually how I, I even, that's how I started. I got luckily got promoted real quick after that, called him right back. said, I'm a, you know, basically much in a much more respectful way, but basically said, I'm a, I, I'm a specialist. Now what, you know, what's, what, what's the next step now? Now I'm ready to be a green beret. When and, you, uh, when you went through the, the special forces selection process, were you going, was 20th group a thing back then? Yep. I went through 20th group. Okay. Yep. Um, Back then, they had just started this horrible, horrible class called SOPC, SOPC Special Operations um, Physical Conditioning Course. It stands for something like that. It's a pre-selection. Mm. And they had just started the 18 X-ray program mm. as well because, you know, the war was kicking off. We knew we, knew we were going to need more Green Berets. So if uh, even if you were prior service or had an MOS already, if you were National Guard, you had to go. You had to go to SOPC. Oh. Otherwise, it was really just an 18 X-ray program. Mm. And there began, outside of maybe dive school, some of the worst three weeks of of my military it career. It was, it was horrible. Um, and and in the best ways, to be honest. With you. They ended up shutting it down, um, and they got a lot of trouble for the things they did. <laughs> um, but it was old school and I, you know, and, and I loved it. And like, and, and, it, and to me, like I showed up to that and they, you know, they were horrible to us. They beat us down, you know, no sleep, no food, you know, talked about your mom and I ate it up, you know, like this is, you know, this yeah. is what I can, like, this is real guys quitting left and right. I loved it. You know, every time I thought about quitting, I'd see a guy quit and go, I can't believe you quit even though I just thought about quitting, yeah. but it gave me the energy I needed yeah. to never, to never be that guy. Uh, and there was actually a, a former Navy SEAL in my class that, uh, that uh, he had got out and he came back in, wanted to go through 20th group. Cause it was, be, it'd be really the kind of the, the easiest way, not easiest because it's the same course, the quickest way to become a green beret. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it didn't work out, he's not stuck in the, in the army, you know, the active duty army. And in SOP C he was like this, this as well. This this is this may be worse than buds. This is wow. this is this is horrible. Um, but they had this. They were super proud of it because they were like, "Hey, 
if you pass this course, we have like a 98% pass rate in selection. Uh, well, of course you did because then I went to selection and selection was easier <laughs> than SOP C. So if you made that course so horrible and you could make that, of course you could make the next course. It makes <laughs> no sense at all to make the pre course yeah, harder, harder than the actual course itself. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was the beginning, uh, the, uh, the entry of, uh, of getting into it and then, you know, go to the Q course, Q course is a long course. Um, what was yeah. your first identifier? Uh, well, my, uh, 14 Sierra air defense artillery yeah. stinger was my very first one. And then 18 echo was, uh, Echoes. was what I, I got when I graduated the Q course, which is uh, special forces communications sergeant. Um, and that's the second longest course, uh, which, which sucked. Cause when all you wanted to do was, was go to war and then yeah. you get assigned the second longest MOS course to go through. Yeah. You know, it's a year and a half, you know, to get through the, the Q course. What's Delta the first one? Long or the medic, yeah, yeah. Eighteen Delta, the medic is another probably six months longer than that. Uh, they you know they're they're they're, they're long courses. I mean, for good reason. You know, uh, you, you get out and you, you are the you know the best in the world technically. You know, in in that job, whether it be combo or or medics, uh, it's a necessary evil. But when you think the, the irony of it is that we we you know we everyone in the in the Q course time was in a hurry to go to war because we're scared. The war is going to go away. Yeah, yeah. And little did we know <laughs> it's the that we, war. yeah, that's right. <laughs> that we were about to bear the brunt of you know of that war more than anyone else. You know, and maybe in the in the in the history of the the military in some aspect because you know my my particular generation that started going to war and you know in 04 to and didn't stop till you know even 2020. You know, yeah, we saw 16, 17, 18 years of war. Um. And it was amazing. So that's, uh, it's, it's what it's, that's what kept me from, from doing my initial plan of doing four years and then, and coming back to the feed store. Um, you know, the fact that there's wars to, you know, I eventually did get to do exactly what I wanted to do, which was go to war and go to war at a, at a high level and, and, and do tangible things, uh, you know, for, for the war on terror. And, Wait. um, and it's, and it's addicting. Like you, you, always, you want, you want one more trip, yeah. one more rotation. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I signed up again and then I re-upped again. And before you know it, 20 years later, you know, your, your career is over and it's a crazy ride. With SF re-up bonuses, I remember, I remember being in and I don't know if it was true or not. The re-up bonuses were rather significant only because they were worried about losing people to like contracting companies and stuff. Yes. But. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 they were, they were decent at that time, and they had, at that you know there were, there were two wars going on. They they couldn't they couldn't lose they couldn't lose SF guys who who really um, I don't just say that because it was a Green Beret, but the, the truth is um, that uh, it's just, it's the truth. The Green Berets um, probably put more on their back than than uh, of the war on terror throughout you know every every. Uh, uh, both theaters and all the rotations than anyone else did. Yeah, I can see that. There's, there's, there's without a doubt, uh, you know, more Green Berets dead, mangled, and shot up uh, than than anyone else. They, they just, uh, they just, they just did it, you know, over and over and over, uh, and probably with the with the least amount of resources too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I'm not saying that we didn't have. You know, we didn't have the right equipment. You know, I always, I always had the guns I needed. I always had the night vision for the most part that I needed. But you know, we, you know, uh, SEAL teams had more money than us. Uh, Did they really? Yeah, SEALs. And if you think about it, you know, is in the Navy. You know, you get a what is it? I'm making up numbers. A billion dollar carrier. You yeah. Know, and you have a, <laughs> a fifty five million dollar jet. You know, and a SEAL team wants you know half a million dollar for equipment. Yeah. You know, that's. That's a wheel to an F eighteen. Yeah, you know what I mean? Just, I didn't they, think about the, it. Like the Navy that. just doesn't. You know, their their budget looks at, but the Army looks at it different, and they look at you know SF and like, man, you you already get so much more. <laughs> you equipment. guys got it, man. You got yeah, yeah. really good with what you got. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, and as always, and it's never enough. Uh, so, yeah, they they probably did the most with the least within the special operations okay. realm. I, I I don't I don't think that's a far out statement to, to make. Okay, so. I, that was my fault. I started asking a bunch of questions about millet. So you get no, out, right. I want to, yeah. I want to yeah. hit the coffee company, but so you get out and we'll go back to the military stuff. Cause I want to yeah. ask you some questions, yeah. but 
you get out and then day one out. How's that start? Day, uh, day one, I, I start doing, uh, some 1099 work contract work. Mm -hmm. Um, just, you know, I just wanted to, uh, the pay's good, but it's, it's, it's sporadic pay. So, um, which was fine with me at the time. Like, yeah, I wanted to, I didn't really want to commit to anything. I wanted to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, so I contracted for a little bit and that was fun. You know, put on some CQB courses, trained some other, you know, some other, um, uh, military special operation white side, you know, how to do CQB and shoot, you know, it was, it was guns. It was, it was fun still hanging around with those guys and thought it was real important at the time. Cause you know, I had a lot of lessons to learn from, from actual combat. And even though there's really not any combat you know, happening at this time and you know, at the end of 2021. Yeah. You know, those are lessons learned that, you know, I wanted to, to impart on the next generation of, uh, of soft personnel. So I did that for a little bit. Um, and then after that, I, I, I just somehow, some way kept on getting asked to, to train these SWAT teams. And so I started traveling, training SWAT teams, uh, you know, literally from coast to coast, you know, really? I've, I've trained, uh, and that year spanned you know, dozens of, of SWAT teams. Um, and that that was really eye opening. I, I didn't expect, you know, for SWAT teams to be like mini Delta Force teams. Like, I, I you know, I don't mm -hmm. um, uh, I have a I'm pretty open minded and I'm pr pretty realistic with you know, what I thought with what I was going to go into and, and see. And um, and I just like watching those guys, you know, some of them like paying for their own equipment you know, paying for their own bullets or range time if they want to go shoot or if they want to go to a, make it a, a shield course, you know, getting denied. And so if you want to go learn how to use a shield, you're going to have to, you know, pay for it out of pocket. Um, that's just, that's crazy to me. It's that, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like we have, <laughs> yeah, th those guys are, you know, when the city needs someone the most or they're going to call those people, and expect them to not embarrass the city mm -hmm. uh, in a weird way, almost the same thing with the Delta Force in the country. You know, that's why we get funded so well. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you made a good point when you said with first responders in general, Delta Force is not coming to save you. Here, <laughs> right. You know, they're, they're not, you know, and they're, and they're called first responders for a reason. Yeah. You know, they're, they're there first. They have the least amount of, you know, of knowledge and, and what's more than likely a really bad situation. That's true medically, tactically. Generally speaking, it's it's why they're deserving of of equipment and training. Um, and when they don't have that, it just it, it infuriates me. I mean, to be honest with you, um, I'm I'm pretty even keel person, but you know, I want to just that that stuff is is just one of the things that uh, I get um, you know I get fired up about. So um, you know, you can you can just sit there and complain about it and 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 wish them and wish that it was different yeah. for them. Um, or you could be naive enough to start a coffee company that, uh, you know, is, is going to help change that. And yeah, we're, we're only three months old, but I'm really proud of the work that we've already done between, you know, cutting a $5,000 check to a law enforcement family in need that had their home basically ripped from, them, uh, from hurricane Irma. And, um, although they were rebuilding it and, uh, and other people were, you know, helping out. You know, when I found out that, you know, a, a, a sheriff deputy is eating off of a plywood countertop because, you know, they can't afford to put countertops in, and, in their home yet. And when I want people to know, when you think first responder, where was this deputy when the hurricane was going on? Uh, saving other people yeah. from the hurricane. He wasn't home. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. You know, he wasn't yeah. home. And that's that is a note when you're a first responder. I mean, in Florida and I'm sure every everywhere is different. You know, with their own natural disasters, but in Florida, first responder, you you have to have a plan for your family because when yeah. the hurricane comes, you are going to be at best sleeping at the station, and that goes for, yeah. you know, every first responder. So, you know, I thought that was really cool that you guys did that. Yeah, I you know uh, found out about that. We raised uh you know we, we raised five thousand dollars for that for that family just to give them really just a you know some some dignity and and for the for the work they do they absolutely they deserve so much more to be honest with you and there's a lot more work that needs to be done uh to that house um we've also you know given a thousand dollars to canines uh united you know for for dogs and dog training dog handlers having to buy their own leashes 
I just, you know, the equipment thing just goes on and on with, with the police departments. Um, so, uh, we we're in talks right now with, um, I talked to the, you know, Arkansas, uh, tactical officer association said that we'd, we'd sponsor, uh, uh, a guy through, uh, through their SWAT course up there when, when, when they put it on. Wow. Um, so we're, 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 we're all into this, you know, for, you know, it's called, you know, we call it coffee with a purpose. You know, it's not just a tagline. That's it's literally what we do. And then sometimes I'll talk to people, or, you know, right now I'll talk to you about it and I will, I will sit here and talk to you for 30 minutes about the things that need to be done, the funds that need to be raised or what we've done already. And then tell you, know, tell you, you know, how much more needs to be done. Uh, and then I forget to talk about the coffee, uh, <laughs> because it's, cause we're a coffee company. People, uh, well, I'll be at the end of there like, but, but how's the coffee? I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I forgot to tell you about the coffee. The yeah. Coffee, coffee is delicious. Yeah, so. co- coffee's really good. Uh, but, and, and it is because it, you know, if we didn't, you know, we, if we don't put good coffee in it, you know, people would buy it once because, you know, they, they love, the, they love the cause and everything, but they're not going to buy a second bag. Well, I, I need you to buy a second, third, fourth and fifth yeah. bag to, to do the things that, that we want to do. So we, we want to do things at a, at a national level. Um, so, you know, we put it, it's a hundred percent Brazilian single source coffee. We did that for a reason. Um, Brazilian coffee is low in acidity. Um, and it's a really smooth coffee. Uh, doesn't have a, as bitter of an aftertaste as you know Colombian coffee will does, and most people use Colombian coffee. It needs to be honest because it's a little cheaper. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, uh, to me, ironically, I don't Brazilian coffee wasn't that much more, uh, and it, and it is that much better. So to us, it was a no brainer. We're gonna put quality coffee in there for a good cause, and uh, I think I think the that business model will will play out at the end. Yeah. I mean, even your merch. I mean, you. You didn't short stroke it at all. I mean, no. like I'm wearing it. Yeah. You, because a lot of you know, a lot of companies will go when they're trying to mass produce and and get money. They will use cheaper two dollar shirts and yeah, you know it is what it is. They're hundred percent cotton. They're baggy. They're not, they're not form fitting. And you know you, I think this yeah. one's next level. Yep, which I'm, I can tell you is I'm, over six dollars a shirt. That's right. I'm a, I'm a shirt snob. <laughs> and then next level sixty forty. Uh, I, there's very few shirts I wear that yeah. that, that aren't that, that aren't that. And then, uh, I mean, your I, hat, it's got the, uh, you know, uh, I, I am, uh, I'm particular when it, when it comes to those things and the, uh, for those, this, this leather patch on this hat was the bane of my existence in my coffee shop as we were trying to get ready for, for weeks. And I, I found this leather patch as you can see, I mean, it's, it's, it's a thicker leather patch, um, as I was looking at kind of prototypes and leather patches, that, that was, that was the one I found that I liked. And so I went to, you know, and, you know, these trucker, particular trucker hats, these are Yupong, but those mm-hmm. have, you could, it can be a Richardson 112 or a Yupong to get nerdy with it. I, I don't care that they're, they're the same hat, but I wanted that thick leather patch because mm-hmm. all the other ones are thin. They don't really look like real leather. Well, now I know why, because no sewing machine goes through that thick leather. Oh. And we went from you know sewing machine company to the next company to the next company. Even went to uh, like a, a seamstress or people who do um, repairs for clothes or uh, yeah. what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, a tailor. Thank you. And they also did the same thing. Like you can't sew through uh, through leather this thick. And so I had to buy one a a specialty leather sewing machine. You bought it. I bought it. So she would sew up our leather hats and everyone else is like, Brent, let the leather patches go. It's not <laughs> that big of a deal. That is awesome. It is. <laughs> I know. Those are, yeah, those are the leather patches I want. No, yeah. I mean, I'm the same way. Like <laughs> I don't like it when you have an idea and you know, a business idea, I mean, it sounds corny, but if you have yeah. a vision and you can see That's, it and right. people are like, no, I wouldn't do it. I, I yeah. wouldn't do it. And, it's hard because you're the only one saying, no, this has got to happen. We got to figure out how it's going to happen. So when I, you know, when I first came up with this, uh, yeah. And, and I really didn't tell a lot of people and that's just, yeah, you know, and yeah, you know, that, that's just been a, a habit of mine for a long time. You know, back when, even while I was you know, a teenager, um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bring girlfriends over, you know, to, to meet my parents, you know, and for whatever reason, I just, you know, uh, unless I, unless I got serious with them, mm-hmm. I didn't tell a lot of people I was doing the army. I just, I don't tell people I'm going to do, you know, I just go do yeah. it. You know, when, the Delta, you know, most people didn't even know I was training up to go to the Delta force outside of my, you know, my team. Um, so I just do things, uh, you know, cause I hate, 
I guess I've always hated people who brag about all the things they're going to do, and then they either, either they don't do it, uh, whether it's their fault or not. It still does, just doesn't look good. Mm-hmm. And it's you know the people that just say all the things they're going to do. And it's kind of like a, a look at me, what I'm going to do. Yeah, you know, if that's yeah. what you want to do, just just shut up and go to work. Yeah. Um. So the few people, no, uh, most people didn't find out I was starting a coffee company until my wife posted it on her Facebook account the day we opened the business. And like, we had yeah. no idea you guys were doing this. And, um, and then a lot of people say, yeah, Hey, why, why coffee? That's man, that's kind of a bad idea, Brent. Don't you think like it's a really saturated mm-hmm. market? And, uh, I said, uh, so why do you think that he's like, you like you don't think there's so many coffee companies like that's just a tough business. You know, why'd you do that? Uh, I said, man, that's can can you name me like can you name me a, a police department like a police themed coffee? Can you name me a fire themed coffee? Can you name me a paramedic themed coffee? And they would go, well, no, I can't. I'm like, well, but you just told me it was saturated. Yeah, you know. And they're like, oh, all right. So people always have you know have their uh, real quick opinions they'll they'll tell you real quick what you should have done and people tell me yeah. all the time hey you know what you should do with your business <laughs> i only laugh and i, I always know. and i always smile and listen uh of course now they'll know when they listen to this and, <laughs> and in the back of my mind i'm like depending on who they are yeah. I all, hey they might have an idea and some of them it's rare but some of them had a good idea so i'll listen to them all but in the back of my mind going please from someone who's never started a business or done anything in their life Tell me what I should do yeah. with my business. Yep. <laughs> what do you think? Like, I, I remember I brought it up to you briefly and it seemed even just reading it. I could tell like, you know, and I've heard you on other podcasts, like kind of touch it a little bit. But what's your opinion on the human psychology of big brands and people that, you know, like like a, like a big coffee brand, like a Black Rifle Coffee Company? I know just people that drink it and I'll, I'll ask why. And they're like, because it's. Black rifle coffee, and I love and I love it, but it's almost like there's so many other coffee companies out there that are smaller that could probably use your business if you're going to be a loyal customer, and they just yeah. So uh, and and to, you know backtrack just real quick, what I just said, uh, you know, can you name a a police coffee, a fire department coffee? I can name yeah, you know, I can name several of them now, but only because I'm I'm you know now I'm in the space, and even uh, most people, I mean, it, uh, your law enforcement can. Can you name? No. Uh, just uh, added by, okay. That's no, you, um, so the uh, Black Rifle has actually has uh, a law enforcement line and a and a firefighter line. Um, but the those guys, I don't. I've I've always said, hey, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna put another company down to uh, to put mine up. But you know, th- there are some things I just can't, I can't. Um, that I have a problem with. I'm also not going to be quiet when I have a problem with something. Mm-hmm. So you can't name yourself Black Rifle Coffee Company and be veteran, pro-veteran, pro-gun bros, and then go public and then find out, you know, all your top guys donate to Democrats. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get political, but I, I have a problem with that. You know, if, if you want to be, you know, pro-Second Amendment um, – and the people you donate to are not pro second amendment. Well, that's, that's who you are. Like who you donate to is who you are. Yep. Um, and you, you would think that they'd have paid the price for that. Most people, most people have no idea. That's a thing. If you, if you go to Reddit and look up black rifle coffee company, Democrats, yeah, you know, it's, it's on fire and Reddit, you know, a, a, well, on fire, you know, there's, a, uh, there's some threads about it, but people quit talking about it and they've already forgotten about it. I, Black Rifle puts out an, another video of fast cars and explosions and no, no one cares anymore. You know? <laughs> and it's just like, and if, and if I, and it's just, you know, I, I don't expect everyone to have my convictions. You know, I, you know, I saw they put a, some sort of unveiling of them putting, you know, Black Rifle on a speedboat. Black Rifle, I don't think that's going to do anything more for your business. You don't think you could have done anything else with that money, but yes, but, that's but, a great put, point. but put your brand on a speedboat. And you couldn't, <laughs> you know, you have these, you know, these veteran causes, and you know these, you know these, you know these police bags and fire department bags. Now, you couldn't have done anything else with your money, but yeah. but put it on a speedboat, and and they will like they'll go. And I'm not saying they don't do anything. Someone's gonna come back and be like, oh, well, they did this. I you know, percentage wise of yes. what they take in and what they do. I believe could be better. Mm-hmm. I'll probably yeah. just leave it I, at that. I remember when the CEO, he got, I mean, I, I, when the whole thing came out, like a, when the donating, 
I don't know if it was damage control or what, but he kind of said like, oh, I lost a bet and I donated 50 bucks to Hillary's campaign. And then that's kind of like where I remember it kind of slowing down. Everybody was like, well, if I'm going to have to actually invest in this and I don't want to. So that's <laughs> yeah, it's and you look at things like grunt style, I think has been public for a very long time. Um, and then my new favorite one is lions, not sheep, which yep. uh, again, I'm trying not to be a hater, but that guy's came out and said, I'm a five time, six time business failure. Like I just kept going and going and going. And I don't think I could be wrong. I'm sure I'll hear about it. I don't think he's ever served a day in his life. And you know, it, lions, not sheep and everybody just, but you know, it's on uh, this and, and, to go back to what you know we were talking about in the day, like you know like these big brands and 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 brand loyalty, and uh, I mean people just they they see something, they connect with it. Yeah, you know, that that's something you know we we deal with you know a lot as a business of how how do you if you believe you have a better product and you believe you have a product that that more aligns with that customer base, and that's why I, I didn't you know I came from the Delta Force. I, you know people was like why don't you do a military coffee. That's ridiculous. Black Rifle owns military vet, you know, themed, you know, coffee. There's no reason to go fight them over that space. That's ridiculous. Um, goes back to what I said. Plus, for me, first responders are going to save my family. That's who I'm going to invest in. That's mm -hmm. uh, just what I. It's just what I've chosen. Um, so I believe we offer them uh, a an alternative that they didn't have before. Yes. But they just have to hear about it. They have to hear about it. They have to know, you know, pe you know, they have to know what, what you're doing is, is true and a, wor a cause worthy to get behind. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. You know, we're just doing it. We're just hustling, doing it, you know, one convention at a time, one show at a time, yep. one podcast at a time, you know, you know, just, you know, social media, uh, it's interviews. A, it's a slow road when you're, yeah. when you're donating as much as you are. <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> it's hey, like, I, you know, I'll, we, we haven't made money yet as a company, and we've donated about eight thousand yes. dollars, which is That's crazy insane. in one aspect. But when you tell people a certain percentage of of a bag is going to go towards charities, I have to do it. You know, mm. I, I didn't say a certain percent of the company's profits. Well, that, that way, I wouldn't have to uh, donate. Uh, that way, you know, some people, say. you know, some people, yeah. you know, I see that wording now, you know, and I, and I catch it, like you know. Portions of pro, you know, of 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 our profits go to. Um, well, if I did that as a as a young company, I I wouldn't I probably wouldn't make a charitable donation for three years, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we'll. Uh, but you know, we it goes back to. But if I don't do those things, people won't believe, or or they'll see through the um, the authenticity the, the the authenticness of 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 the company and who we are, what we stand for. So we have to do it. And we have no problem doing it. It's why we started. Well, we got a lot of uh, first responders that listen to this, so I'm gonna. I've been reaching out to them and, and asking them, you know, and they they know who you are. Yeah. But it's funny. Uh, maybe it's just your young company. They they were like, oh, I've never didn't know there was a coffee company for first responders. You yeah. Know? So. Yeah. I I it's and, and social media is funny. Uh, you know. Uh, Blue Line Beast, Blue Line Beast uh, mm -hmm. helps us out a lot. You know, they're they're an ambassador for us. You know, they have you know probably a quarter million you know followers yeah. on on Instagram, um, and uh, yeah, who you know law enforcement, police posts. You know, mm -hmm. all, you know all these you know uh, Fifty Shades of FTE. You kind of go down the list. We have a decent amount of people on social media that 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 have gotten behind the cause, and uh, and and push. And so it's so some, sometimes it's funny, like how many people haven't heard of us and, you know, we'll, I'll go to a random convention, just make it up and, you know, in South Carolina and someone will come in like, oh yeah, I heard of you guys. Yes. Yeah, you know, saw, saw you. Yeah. I see you talk to, you know, get a shot on, on, on blue line beast all the time. Uh, I'm like, that's okay. That's but, but people in but, but our own backyard may not have, may not have heard of us. <laughs> so, and, you know, social media is weird like that. So are you, uh, are you, I briefly touched upon it with you. Are you okay with talking about your uh, 2014 incident? No, absolutely. Yeah. I'll so, you're, this is, uh, what combat theater is this? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Okay. Yep. Um, it's a long story. That's I'll, right. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll try to do it justice and, and, and not, and not draw it out. But, um, long, long story, not so short. 
Uh, we, we had a high value target coming from Pakistan. Um, he didn't come in very often. And so they were, um, they were very excited about an opportunity, uh, at this guy. And so they, uh, obviously we, we, we got the mission and, and we let them know, Hey, nothing's right about this mission. Um, the, you know, we're, we're, we're tracking this guy. We, we know where he's at. We know where he's going. We're, we're, we're watching him. Um, Let's uh let's develop this target and we'll 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 hit, we'll hit it tomorrow. Um, plus, you know, there's cloud coverage. ISR can't can't see anything. You know, we don't really know what we're getting into. Um, ironically, the whole reason why this guy came in was because of us. Um, we had been operating in this particular um, area for probably the last I don't know, seven ten days, almost nightly, going in and just uh and just wreaking havoc with uh with um large numbers getting uh, racked up each night. And so this guy had to come in because we decimated their, their whole leadership. So he had to come in to appoint new leadership. Wow. Um, How big is this AO by the way? Is it? Um, this, uh, I've never been to Afghanistan. So like sometimes people tell it's me, a, it's, about it's a, it's like a, pro, it's a provincial size. AO. Okay. It's, a, it's a province. Um, and so, uh, so, and also it's a juicy target, right? Cause not only is it, you know, a guy coming in from overseas, but, you know, we get an opportunity to kill the next set of leadership that isn't even leadership yet. You know, that's yeah. and that's and now you're getting ahead of the curve. And and that's really kind of how you stop stop terrorism. If you can kill them fast enough, often enough, at some point they'll go, hey, don't don't nominate me. I, I don't want to die. But if you don't kill them fast enough and, you know, they don't <laughs> die for four, six months, a year, two years, you know, the next guy that, you know, will just be like, oh, well, he he screwed up. You know, I'll. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll outsmart I, him. I never you know? thought about it. Like so, that. you know, the, the, uh, you know, it matters how fast you remove them. Um, it, it deters them. It really does. So, so they, you know, you add all this up, they really wanted to go. And we said, it's just, it's not a good night for that. And they said, okay, uh, if you don't want to go, we'll send the Rangers. And, um, <laughs> and the, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, this guy's coming in, he has, I forget the numbers, but it's something like seven or eight armed guards, you know, that, that come with them. Plus the, uh, the people he was going to, uh, appoint, you know, talking four to six guys and plus for it to be official, there's a judge council, a Taliban judge council there of another four to six guys. So you're talking about, you know, 20 armed guys on target. Um, and they happen to be, uh, in the worst place, which is like in the middle of, of, a of a village. So there's really no good way to get there. And so we said, hey, do not send the Rangers. Um, they, great guys, have nothing against them. But uh, this is not a target for them. Uh, you send them, Rangers will die. Mm -hmm. Unless you want to call people's wives and moms tonight, do not send the Rangers. And they said, then then you better go or send the Rangers. Um and this is one of the things I loved about uh, being in the unit. Uh, we came together as, uh, as you know, as as the, the couple, the assault team came together, and we said, "Hey, um, yeah, do we want to do this or not? It's not a smart idea. Like this is not. We should develop this, and you know, put put the odds in our favor." Um, and and we all and we every every single person raised their hand and said, "Yeah, we'll we'll go tonight because yeah, uh, if we don't, every one of those." those rangers get shot up or die tonight will will be because of us like we the odds are in our favor but I th we think we'll but we'll come out on top so we launch um what's the project what's the objective of this mission is it i don't want to sound I, I just don't know like is it capture or kill or is it <laughs> i mean like I, yeah, what's, uh, what's I, on paper versus I, what's in your head um uh, what's yeah what's What's on paper will say capture kill. Uh, I won't speak for the whole assault force. What's what's in my head is uh, kill as many terrorists as we can that night. Um, that's just just not not to sound edgy or mm -hmm. you know macho about it. That's just that's, that's just my mentality. You know, we there's there's no reason to put them into a system just to watch them get released. Mm -hmm. Three months later, six months later, released ever. Um, so we can we can. We can get through this judge and jury process uh, really quick on target, <laughs> and uh, and be done with it. So, um, so we 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 go. Um, we didn't, yeah, yeah. I've told the story just a few times. Why didn't you fast? You guys fast rope in? 
no. Uh, I hate fast roping. And if you want to be stuck on a really loud helicopter that you know that says look at me the americans are here in the middle of the night and then dangle on a rope for you know for five seconds but wait 30 seconds to dangle on that rope and just hope no one shoots up at you the whole time fast roping is there's a time and a place for it but it's Mm. it's not it's not sexy not in real life uh so we um uh we we landed and we 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 ran in you know as fast as we could By, by the time we got there the uh the fire was still lit. You could tell people were there. Plenty of Taliban literature all around, but no one was home. Uh, we we knew this was an option, knowing where we were going to land, how long it would take us to to run to the objective. That if they didn't stay and fight, if they decided to run, that this might happen. We happen to know that um, uh, the uh, one of the guys the who owns the house, his uncle lived in the village as well. So by association, our follow on was to go hit the uncle's house. It's probably a logical place for them to, to go next. While they were setting up at the uncle's house, we, um, the, finally the cloud coverage had started to dissipate. And now the ISR, the unmanned drones with the video feeds in the sky can now see everything that's going on. Luckily for us. And they're starting to let us know like, Hey, there's, there's guys over here hiding in the trees. There's guys over here, you know, laying out in the field. Um, so it was, uh, I was tasked that night. Those are called squirters because they mm-hmm. squirt out of the objective. Um, so that's the slang term for them. And uh, I was tasked with a squirter, running down squirters that night. So me, three or four Afghans, um, I think I had, a, I had a dog guy with us and a, and a commo guy all this little team starts starts going out these these different um, these different pockets of people. What normally happens when you're on squirter control is you, you get on the radio um, and they and they talk you in. They're like, "Hey, keep walking. They're 300 feet in front of you, 200 feet in front of you, 100 feet. Hey, you know they're at your feet." So everything to me is kind of is it really puts the ball in your court. I get to know where they are. They don't know where I am. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're letting me know how close I'm getting. Um, and usually it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Odds are in our favor. Uh, you know, we, we win almost, almost every time. So as we're eliminating these pockets of people, um, uh, to their surprise, right? To their surprise. Yeah. Right. Very much, <laughs> very much, that? very no, much to their surprise. <laughs> um, the uh you know we 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 haven't we haven't had jackpot yet we haven't we haven't found the the big target that we're looking for i'm listening to the radio traffic you know the the guys that had gone to the follow on still haven't haven't hit jackpot yet so i'm going to keep you know eliminating these bad guy pockets in and around the village and, until someone hits jackpot you know and so that was my mindset well um the next call comes to the radio is hey there's there's some guys uh um, hanging out in this grove, um, if uh, orchard, if you uh, you know, go there next. I hate orchards. Uh, orchards are are uh, risky business because there's a lot of overhead, you know, kind of cover, and so the ISR can't always see really good in the orchard. So the numbers you get and where people are aren't always mm-hmm. accurate. Um, I prefer to not play fair and know completely what's uh, what's going on. So we we come up to this uh, to this orchard. I can see over this half wall uh, this group of guys, and they have I can see they have AKs. Um, and I make this uh, I make this kind of wild plan, and I tell everyone else to sit back, and I'm gonna go up to this half wall, and I'm gonna get a grenade out, and I'm just gonna chuck it on the other side of this half wall, and then when it goes off and surprises them all, I'm just gonna pop up like inglorious bastards in the movie theater and just shoot them all. <laughs> and I am so excited about this plan. Um, and it is going flawless. I'm already thinking, man, we get to the campfire tonight. When I tell this story, the boys aren't going to believe it. <laughs> and I, I'm laying on the other side of this half wall, you know, laying on my back, getting my grenade out. I can hear them four feet on the other side of this wall, uh, talking their terrorist language. And, Uh, I'm just about to pull the pin and I look over to my left just to make sure that, you know, everyone is back where I told them to be. And this one Afghan is walking towards me for some unknown reason, but that's what they do. And his night vision isn't as good as mine. It was a really 
it was a very dark night. And of course, the darker the night, the worst, mm-hmm. the, 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 you know, the, the least, the less effective your, your night vision are. And so with his bad ones, I bet the, everything probably looked green and fuzzy to him. It was also a rainy night. So you have fog, you know, coming up and, and your, and your nods the whole time. So it was a really bad night for that. Um, and he trips on his way to me and everyone on the other side of this half wall hears him trip thud on the ground and his AK, you know, make a, a big sound and they start just laying down fire, empty and mags in that direction of, uh, of the sound. Well, I'm on my back on this half wall looking up and what was supposed to be my greatest moment is now AK muzzle flashes, you know, two feet above my face. And yeah. I'm thinking, uh, I hope they don't know I'm here. This is bad. This is not, not good. And I have this grenade in my hand, but because they keep shooting over the half, I don't want to, I don't want to get my, my hand shot. And so I just, you know, I just sit there. I'm like, well, I'm just going to wait that out. They clearly don't know I'm here. Um, you know, they, they, everyone drops a, you know, a mag on full auto and I can hear them start to run. Uh, I jump up real quick, try to throw a grenade at them. Um, if anyone's really seen grenades, it's not like the movies. They're not massive explosions. Uh, grenades, on, unless they're in a small area, which at the beginning these guys were, uh, they're not real effective. So I throw a grenade just out of, just out of frustration. Nothing happens to them. I'm look back. Everyone's fine. They, they, they didn't hit anyone. And there goes my, there goes my moment of greatness. Now I'm mad. I am upset that these guys had the, had the audacity to fuck up my plan. Um, and, uh, ISR is reporting on, Hey, they're moving, they're moving, they're moving. Is your element close to you? Or are you away from they, the element? Okay. So they, and this, they are now, they're a couple hundred meters away from me. Maybe I don't know, I make it up 400 meters away from me. They heard the gunfire. You know, I report back it, you know, who was that? Is everyone okay? Yeah, we're, we're good. You know, we're, you know, it's just engagement with, with some squirters. We're going to, uh, we're going to pursue them. Well, when those, that group of, of, uh, four squirters runs away, by the time they stop and hunker down, they're about a kilometer away from the assault element, which is like 0.6 miles. That's not, that's usually too far. You don't normally go that far away, um, by yourself or not by yourself. And, and, and the element we had that is too far away. Yeah. I should have uh, had a couple more operators come with me. Because at the end of the day, even though we have a dog guy with us who was a Green Beret and a great dude, uh, and my commo guy is a Green Beret and a great dude, they're not filling roles as a Green... You know, they're filling specific roles, a commo guy, mm-hmm. a dog handler. I'm the only like real shooter operator on this mission as a Delta Force guy. I should have brought another, some more Delta Force guys with me. But in my at the time, I was like, I, they're... They're still pushing on the objective. I don't want to take yep. people off that. There's a reason why I didn't. So I make the call. Yeah, it's a little far, but no one's hit jackpot yet. And maybe he's one of yeah, you know, he's one of those. So we 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 venture much further out than we should have. Um Oh, because there's a chance that one of those guys is jackpot. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And so um the uh, we get out there and just it's just a it's a it's a it's a calm it's, it's just it's, it's a combo issue for whatever reason everyone's calm it just stops working and this airplane that's talking me on to to this next group of squirters that that is now kind of personal to me that I want to kill um, I, I, I lose comms with the aircraft and I have no idea where these guys are and I, but I know I'm close from from my last update but I don't know where they are. And so we break off and we're trying to look for these guys and we can't find them like it. And at the end of the day, it's also really easy. Even if I'm in, within a couple hundred meters of these guys to not find them, you know, and night, especially in these conditions. So we break off, we look for them, look for them, can't find them. The best way I can describe it is in between these two houses is a field. And in this field is like a big bomb crater. And I looked in this bomb crater and, uh, we start hearing some um, helo communication from the from the Blackhawks, and they're saying, "Hey, um, if you guys don't get off the objective soon, we're gonna have to go back and refuel. And if we have to do that, oh, it, we'll it, we'll be back in an hour. But yeah. let us know. Do you do you want to leave in ten minutes, or do you want to leave in an hour?" And so, um, uh, one of the guys is like, "Hey, Brent, we got to go. 
like you know because uh, if, if we're a small um, if whatever the uh, whatever the main assault element wants to do is the plan yeah. we're going to piggyback on and plus i can't tell them hey can you wait a little bit longer because i'm like a click away from you guys they'd be like what the hell are you doing a click away from us and that's the last <laughs> time i'm on squirter detail okay so um i'm like all right l- let me just fix this real quick i think he is down there um and i go up one more time and uh Again, it was just such a dark and rainy night. Everything looked kind of green and like a bunch of rocks down there. I even, of course, I sent the dog down there, but the dog didn't hit on anything. And the dog handily even told me, hey, windy, rainy night, not the best night to trust the yeah. dog. So all that being said, I still walked up there believing that my spider sense told me something was down there. So the plan was, hey, I'm going to do a, I'm going to walk up there. We're going to get the Afghans online with me. And I'm going to do a quick blip. It's a white light blip. Just look under my nods and just and do a white flash. The thought process, if I'm wrong and they're somewhere else, it was just real quick. And maybe they saw something that maybe they didn't. But if I throw a grenade down there and I'm wrong, then they definitely know we're here. Uh, good plan or not, it's the plan I went with. We get lined up. I do a white light blip. Um, look under my nods. And that's when I realized those aren't rocks down there. Some of them are. And the other four of them are, are people hiding underneath blankets. And so uh, I actually almost. Were they tracking you? No, they're still no. on their blankets. They don't even know. They don't even know really that a white light just hit them. Okay. More than likely. I, mean, I don't know how porous their blankets are, but I, I blip it. I actually start to walk away for a second, assuming that oh, it's, they're probably not here. And like almost like as I'm turning to walk away, I realize what it is I saw and I come back on my gun and uh, I yell, there's the motherfuckers, get them. Um, And so I start shooting one guy. Uh, He's still in his blanket. He doesn't even know why he was getting shot. He he just, he just, he's under his blanket one second. It's not funny. Sorry. Yeah. He's, (laughs) he's not with 72 virgins the next second. Um, So, you know, I transition to the next guy. He's coming out of his blanket uh, reaching for his gun. Uh, I, I shoot him 10 times. I transition to the next guy. He's just about to get his gun up and I shoot him. Um, and as I'm, and you can tell, like, you know, they know we're here obviously. And the, the next guy is a little bit closer to, to being ready to fight than the last guy. And so by I get to the fourth guy, I transition with my eyes first after I send my last round to him and I can see he's getting ready to pull his gun up. And I think I'm behind. He's yeah. closer to getting his gun up than I am. And and I remember you know, telling myself in that second, you know, drive hard, shoot fast, drive the gun, shoot fast. Um, and he got on the gun quicker than I did. Uh, you know, he was ahead of me and uh, he put a, um, a full auto burst and, you know, a bunch of rounds hit below me because he was, he was below me. He's probably 12 feet away from me. Um, and uh, I can even remember like, you know, watching the, 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 the dance dirt in my periphery as it walks up and the, uh, the last round or the one of the rounds hit me right in my arm and it shattered, shattered my, my forearm bones into a hundred different pieces, just a direct hit, um, which spun me around. And the next round uh, hit my nods hit them square in the middle of my nods and broke my nods in half. And that kind of spun me in it's on ISR video and it spins me around three or four times. And I land on my back in the mud and, uh, what was more expensive for the army, your arm or those nods? Uh, my, my arm. <laughs> Probably your arm. Yeah. Yeah. When seven <laughs> operations later, uh, it was my arm. <laughs> Brent, you're okay. All those <laughs> nods though. Are they still? <laughs> yeah. Those were not, those, I mean, those were, those were Pano in 2014. Panos were, weren't even in video games yet. Yeah. You know, we, we're the only ones using those, uh, then. And, uh, so I remember sitting on my back going, I knew I was going to get shot eventually. You know, this is like my 10th combat rotation at mm-hmm. this point in my career. Yeah. Everyone else on my team has a purple heart. I'm the only one. And I remember going, damn it. I knew I was going to get shot eventually. Uh, just upset about being shot. Um, and even thinking, yeah, it didn't hurt as bad as I thought it was going to hurt. Um, and then, uh, and then I, as I'm talking to myself, these weird things, I hear this thunk in the mud next to my head. It's hard to s- t- tell how far away it was. I'm guessing it was four feet. Were you away. down? Yeah, I'm still on my back. Okay. Um, 
And I think I think to myself, that sounded like a grenade hitting the in the mud. You know, why don't you get up and, and, and try to go home tonight? And uh and I was like, well, I you know, I have these thoughts on my head, well, stay down now. Like it's gonna go off in a couple seconds. <laughs> oh man. And so I'm just sitting there on my Shit. back, just just quenching, you know, and like four seconds later it takes a grenade to go off, it doesn't go off. And I go, Oh, huh. Yeah. You know, and and you think you know what a grenade sounds like in the middle of the night hitting the mud. And I go to stand, I go to get up, and it goes off right, right by my face. Holy shit! So I just get shot. Yeah, five seconds later, I get hit by a grenade, and then I, I you know, lay back in the mud. And I just remember thinking, this is not my night. <laughs> and uh, and so I, and I can't see anything. You know, my nods, you know, my my nods are gone. I, I I'm trying to go for my gun, um, although it didn't, it didn't feel great. Don't get me wrong. Uh, getting shot wasn't the worst thing. But my arm did not want to move. Uh, mm-hmm. That's for sure. Um, and and now I'm hoping, man. I hope those Af. I don't remember hearing those Afghans shoot a single round. And I hope they choose to shoot around real quick because I'm in a bad way. Um, and thankfully, uh, my commo guy, uh, you know, pushes up. And um, as that guy's trying to crawl out of the hole and run for his life, uh, my commo guy and him get into a gunfight. And uh, and he he kills my commo guy kills him. And uh, my comma guy gets shot in the in the leg uh, in that exchange, and so this story is already too long. That started the kilometer movement of two guys shot, which is almost you know, which is a third of our our uh, our element. One guy doesn't have nods and can't carry his own rifle because it kept on hitting my arm. Yeah, and uh, and comms are bad that night. Yep. We keep on trying to tell everyone, hey, we got two guys shot. We're trying to get in. Um, and for whatever reason, the assault force swears they heard Brent's shot in the face. Um, so they're they're expecting, they think they're carrying me in. They don't know where we are. They keep on asking for us. Hey, where, where are you at? We'll come to you. Comms are just the worst. You know. And um, what really saved my, my life that night was um, the Blackhawks heard this intermittent um, radio chatter. They knew enough that a guy was shot. Mm-hmm. And they knew that they were going to run out of fuel by the time we got to the to the helicopters, so that wasn't an option. They also knew if they moved back to refuel, it was going to take them an hour, and and there'd be out of blood out by that time. Yeah. Um. So uh, they did was probably one of the coolest things I, I've personally witnessed in my career, and they sat down those twenty million dollar helicopters in the middle of the field in Afghanistan without permission to save fuel. Uh, after you know we've been four the whole element been four different firefights that night it's a hot area and they're like you know what the boys are in trouble um i'm just gonna i'm just gonna i'm just gonna land this thing in the in the in in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere and uh because because they need us and that is um that's what saved my life By by the time i got reconnected with the assault force I was blacking out from a loss of blood. I did. A, we did a good job of turning, kidding, uh, turn a uh, turn a kidding my arm, but we didn't do a good job of assessing the the shrapnel damage that was that was in my leg and my right side of the body. And I was, I was bleeding out and, and didn't even know it from those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. And so I, I basically, you know, I, I was in and out by the time I got to the bird. Uh, I do remember, uh, waking up at at certain points and just feeling the helicopter just shake and shake and shake and shake. Uh, and apparently they, you know, they, they told me, you know, they told me later that the, I guess they, they, they measure in percentages and they normally fly at like 90% power. He was like, they were pushing that thing at like 110% power to try to get me back to the, uh, uh, to the hospital uh, to try to save my life. And so it was just, it was just really, a really humbling experience that, you know, the one sixtieth will do anything it takes uh, yeah. for the boys on the ground. And, and that is a, that is a, uh, some that, you know, no one else gets, gets to experience, but us, but how amazing those one sixtieth pilots are. They, they really are. And they don't get half the credit they deserve. Now that I have you all alone, I want to talk to you about our sponsor, refracted wolf apparel This is apparel for the front line, whether it be first responder, military veterans, frontline workers, or just a supporter of those occupations in general. This is the apparel company for you. We got our best sellers, Demon Hunter, Defund Dancing Cops. Everybody fucking hates Dancing Cops. Hell Within, another best seller. 
hats, stickers, flags, you name it. Refracted Wolf Apparel has it. Use promo code ANTIHERO for 15% off Refracted Wolf Apparel. So I guess another thing I want to talk to you about is, you know, mental health. Because I've never understood how special operators can see what they see and live what they live every day. And I, and I'm not taking away that, you know, regular military or anybody that just does a one deployment doesn't have any type of stress or, you know, PTSD, but you know, it's always blowing my mind how guys can do 20 years of constant, you know, combat, come home, do the barbecues, do the football games. And then it's hey, I'm back out there. And it, it just, I've never really got, I've never really asked anybody actually. You're not going to like this. <laughs> um, this is, uh, uh, if you're going to ask me, I'll answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of a two part question or two part answer. Cause we, I, I do believe in, in, in mental health. Here's, here's also my take on it. Uh, uh, one, uh, I actually like to call it PTSI. So, you know, post-traumatic stress injury, I call it a disorder, something you'll, you'll never get over. And you're just, and you're just, screwed up for the rest of your life you have a disorder you don't get over a disorder i believe it's more of an injury um you know i i don't have ptsd i i sleep like a baby at night um i enjoyed killing every person i killed they all deserved it again that's just that's just a you know that's just the truth the guys my friends my teammates that were fathers and husbands and brothers you know that that died doing the job you know, some of them died literally right next to me. And unfortunately there's more than, 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 uh, than, than I'd like, but they knew the hazard. They willingly did it. It could have been me. I don't know why it wasn't me. You know, it, it, it was them. It, it wasn't cause they did anything wrong. Um, usually it's cause they were doing, you know, they were doing amazing things. Um, I just don't didn't, you know, did it hurt when it happened? Yeah. It hurt when it happened. Uh, but you know, it's crazy to also for me to think that someone's going to come volunteer to do this job and then see bad things and be like, oh, man, I saw bad things. What were you expecting? Yeah, y- you did. And and when I saw him, I, I knew it. You know, so when I saw it, it wasn't to me, it just wasn't that big of uh, a deal. I, mean, I shouldn't. It was at the time, but. A couple days later, three, four, five, you know, every, every death is a little different, you know, get together, cry it out, talk about the good times. And then, uh, I don't care what anyone else says or thinks. And then you pack up those feelings in a little box and you put it in the back of your mind and you go to work and that's what you do. And you don't talk about it forever and cry about it every day and tell everyone how much you miss them and how much you wish things were different. You put it in a box, you put it in the back of your mind and you go to work. And then once a year during that event, you take that box out, you open it up a little bit, you take a shot, you call your friends, you cry a little bit, you tell some jokes and you put it back in that box. You put it far in the, far in the back and you go to work. I'm just really tired to be honest with you of this, of this mental health PTSD, not saying it's not a thing, but we lost my numbers will be wrong. Yeah. Make it. Yeah. I'll be close. 10,000 people and two wars of 20 years between Iraq and Afghanistan. We lost 55,000 in Vietnam. How do we have 10 times the amount of PTSD in, in these wars? Mm -hmm. It's it. And, and most guys that went over didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm personally a little bit tired of it. You know, that we make such a big deal about it. Now, again, I will cap out this. This is me, special operations that, you know, I knew teammates were going to die. I knew we were going to see death on target. So it wasn't a big deal. I'll transition this over real quick, you know, to, to law enforcement. Some law enforcement didn't sign up for that, you know. And so when they see it, it, it boggles their mind a little more because they never have accepted the possibility that this is something I'm going to face. So when they see it, it's a, it's a huge jolt to them. And mm-hmm. so it affects them harder. But, um, generally speaking, uh, I, I don't think we do a good job of, of dealing with it. And if, if the, 
Uh, if the mental health people were right and talking about it and talking about your feelings and getting a, a look of me dog with a vest to walk around with you everywhere worked, then we wouldn't have 22 <laughs> veterans a day killing themselves. I'm not, I'm la I'm only laughing cause I've, I've yeah, I know that was, that, that was unfortunately a joke, uh, <laughs> right, right before uh, a sobering stat, but, but it's, but it's true, yes. you know? Yeah. So I don't know, maybe, maybe well, you should do what I do. Maybe it's not so crazy. No, you're right. I think I've never thought about this before. It's like with law enforcement, um, the cops that sign up, like I know a bunch of us that signed up. We were in the academy going, oh, yeah, here we go. This is yeah. going to be the front, you know, what they call it, uh, front row seat to the best show in the world. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and those guys turn it into a lifestyle. You get the dark humor. You get, but they love it. And it's the people I think that you thought that were going to go serve their community. Yeah. And didn't watch the same movies, have the same upbringing I did, and a total different idea of what law enforcement right. would be. And I can see how some of the things they see, they're just like, God. And they see it and watch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and we tell we tell these, you know, these guys, we tell them like, hey, it's it's okay to hurt. It's okay to deal with these things. It's okay to think about them all the time. It's it's okay to be overwhelmed with emotion and not go to work today. You're yes. dealing with this. No, none of those things are true. It's 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 not okay. Again, that's why I like to call it more of it's it's an injury. Some people take longer to get over that injury than others. But the way we tell people that you know, basically, we come to accept the fact you may always deal with this and never get over it. Now it's a part of you. No, mm -hmm. I refuse to accept that, and and so should everyone else dealing with it. It may take you longer than than me. You know, my wife calls me a robot, uh, <laughs> you know, and yeah, you know, I just, you know, I was, and lucky, you know, and lucky for me, I am, you know, and, and it's not like I don't have any empathy towards people who, who, uh, you know, who, it's who what, have emotions. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. I don't have emotion. You know, I'm not saying that's, you know, that's a great thing, but, but it's come, not that you don't on. care. You and, just put it in your black box. And, and this is, and in the day, uh, th this is where I think, you know, if, if I don't say this, people just think that um, I'm, you know, I'm just an a-hole, but I do believe people are mentally injured through these things harder than other people. So if resources are finite and, and everyone's dealing with it for her and for, for their whole life, then those resources go to everyone. You know, and if everyone, even the people who saw a little bit of things, but, you know, they're going to claim like it's, you know, a, a massive deal they can't deal with rather than just sucking it up. You are sucking resources away from mm -hmm. someone who really saw some really bad stuff and is really having a hard time with it. So at the end of the day, that's what I get the most mad about. And I don't care if it's law enforcement or military. There's only so much resources to go around. So if it was just a small incident to medium incident, deal with it mm -hmm. because we have we have resources we have to give the people who can't deal with it yeah i know that um when pulse happened i was not working in that area at the time i was actually in the police academy when pulse happened and you'll hear you'll see people talk that took their awards and they never talk about it again and then it um there was people medically retiring from a perimeter position and things like that that people medically retire and it's one of those things where people can't say no you're not fucked up so our society yeah. is a little softer. Right. So everyone's like, I guess you're, we <laughs> we're giving, we're giving uh PTSD out to guys who listened to combat on the radio, radio operators that heard it on the radio and can't deal with it. No. And, and we allow okay. this. No, suck it up. I don't care what you heard on the radio. If the guys that are out there dealing with the firefight can deal with it. So can you. Yeah. There's another big thing where, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's uh people that are getting lifestyle lifestyle change stress um ptsd i guess in disability is a it's kind of like an umbrella so if you have if you claim a bunch of any condition it it, they, it falls under that and they're claiming lifestyle change for like basic training and i know a couple of these guys and you know i again i don't i try not to make enemies and, and i keep my opinions to myself most of the time but it is a thing where guys aren't even going in country at all and and they're no they're able to claim a, a significant they're not able to medically retire but the chunk they're getting is is kind of significant yeah um absolutely uh it's it it's a i don't it's it's a pandemic 
and and the military started it and i hate to say it the military is taking advantage of a of of a country that loves our military and won't make the same mistake we did in vietnam so we've gone too far i believe to kind of to show appreciation and 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 respect the, the military that's a weird way to say it um not oh, you're right but you know to to a point where we won't we won't call out bullshit well and a lot of people feel and it's again it's right some people say rightfully so other people say but i know a bunch of people if i ask them like you you know ask them about veterans oh bro and i'll go mm-hmm. just give me it for real and they're like you're really annoying sometimes <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like One. hey everybody thinks it <laughs> I, I know. but i guess and i heard you say in another podcast because i stalked you a little bit you said that um the country and the government are did do a very good job of riding the ship of military appreciation post Vietnam. Yeah. And that now you kind of, and I don't get it. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you, you stated that law enforcement might need to be righted like that as well. No oh, one that's, that'd be the understatement of, of, of the day right there. Um, that, that's part of, you know, I think the, what, uh, what, what drove me this year is, this initial feeling of 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 one can do this came from the 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 defund the police movement. Mm. All all of it is was just was was asinine. Like if story after story after story of people rioting, um, only ninety percent of the time, only to find out the cops were right the whole time. If you just waited for the story to come out, and uh, people aren't going to want to, you know, not everyone wants to hear this, but still, even when the cops were wrong. They were they were forced to make a decision that was still wrong, but if 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 the suspect didn't, um, you know, uh, didn't resist, none of that would have ever happened. Uh, so it's just it's an it's an insane movement to me that um, I feel like if if we yeah you know, and we wonder why things aren't getting better well because we misdiagnosed the problem. Uh, let's, let's go on a national movement to tell, to tell people, Hey, listen to cops when, when they pull you over and you have a 0% chance of being shot. You have a 0% chance of being shot. There's not one instance of someone getting out of their car, doing everything the police says and getting shot. Not one show me. So let's, that's how I've lived. I've, yeah. I've got, I've gotten pulled over and arrested. You know, I'd, and all I did was just say yes, sir, to police. I didn't know you could say anything different. <laughs> you know, I noticed that too. The one. So yeah, it? they we need we need to you know, the the, the respect that law enforcement should have is not there yet. Again, I say it all the time. You know, I've told it before. When these people, whether they respect the police or not, when they have their you know their darkest day, they will call you in a heartbeat and expect you to be there. Mm-hmm. I think you should respect someone that that will be there in your darkest day. Yeah. And and put their life on the line for years. And there's a lot of, you know, correlation to, you know, to my job in law enforcement when it comes to that. I was asked, you know, by my country, night in, night out, you know, on on a bunch of deployments to put my life on the line. Law enforcement does the same thing. And just because there's a fraction, fraction, fraction of them that have made a mistake doesn't mean we don't give the the other hundreds of thousands do the right thing day in, day out, the respect they deserve. And I have um, a lot of friends that are, you know, in the fire and paramedic industry. And I agreed with what you said in the past that, you know, the cops get a, a do get a brunt of hate, but you know, they're also cops. They're, they're a little, they're a little bit more able to, you know, if you're a cop, you know, people are like, fuck you and you don't care. You're a little, I'm not saying we're tougher, <laughs> But, you know, but we at least get the glam of, you know, the the cop, you know, he's a cop. He's a guy with the, the badge and the gun and whatever feeling comes with that. And then you got paramedics who I oh, you, you yeah. get just get the I, shit end of the stick. Aunt, this is something I do get, you know, riled up about, you know, a, a little bit is is the lack of I say respect. But, you know, the lack of um, acknowledgement, you know, uh, uh, of paramedics and, and, and our EMS. Uh, and again, like I, those, those guys, just, you know, make up a scenario that is not far fetched at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they get to see 
a minivan, you know, with three kids and a mom that were doing nothing wrong, just driving to school one day, they get sideswiped by a semi and, you know, they're trying, they're trying to keep kids alive long enough to get to a hospital. Like, I mean, I, that's, that's not an ideal, uh, job and situation yet. It, yet it is I mean, what's more noble than that to mm -hmm. sit there and try to save lives of people who were doing nothing wrong yep. and end up in, you know, on, on the bad end of, of a situation. And for them, they will save more lives every day than police and firefighters combined. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a, I don't, I don't have the stats to back that up, but I think, yeah. I think, it, no, I think we could agree with that it's statement. A true, it's a true uh, statement. Hey, cops are the first ones to go. <laughs> Oh, thank God I didn't have to see that. You know, they show up four minutes later and some of the worst yeah. trauma you've ever seen is yeah. being yeah. transported and you're yeah. like, you know. Yeah. So so I talk about <laughs> mental health, like oddly enough, like that's I my heart will go out to those guys way faster than than a police officer, you know, just to be honest with you, when it mm -hmm. comes to m mental health, like because to me, when, when, you know, cops get shot fighting bad guys, like that's that's part of it's part of the game. Like you signed up for it. You know, I, you have to accept this, but you know, for, for those paramedics. And again, you could argue like, you know, they know what they're signing. They know they're going to see these things. Uh, no one, no one fully understands what it's like to see a mangled kid until, you know, until they do. Mm -hmm. And, and again, but this it's an, it's an injury. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't have you on the sideline the rest of your life because you saw something bad. Um, yeah, you, know, you got to go back to work the next day. Cause you got more kids that, you know, that you need to save. And I think paramedics do a good job of that. Generally speaking, or, or else they'd all quit job. They'd all quit their jobs after yeah. a year from, from, from mental health. So again, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I love talking about paramedics and, uh, um, I, I think, uh, I, you should, you should do a podcast with, with, a with, a uh, a lifelong paramedic and probably hear some of the stories that person could tell. We're trying to get somebody from the fire EMS side on here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one a couple more things for you. One thing I want to ask you: What's the main difference when you train law enforcement, whether it be uh, just tactics to, you know, patrol, or you know, training a, a, a full time SWAT team that is trying to be as sharp as they possibly can? What's the main difference between training them and then training like a, a military in country that you know? Uh, the the biggest difference is of. Uh, standards and, and SOP. And I don't even mean that in a bad way. I'll, I'll explain military CQB generally, uh, is, is put out by, by regulations and there's a doctrine for it. And yes, units do it a lot better than others, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's regimented, you know, you, the first time, not the first time, but you know, within the, you know, the first month of, of seeing SWAT teams and you, you know, start seeing all these different, um, ways of, of doing work, you know, uh, limb pin, like limited penetration, um, you know, strong wall and dynamic, you know, and all these, these, these different tactics, you know, like that's a big difference that, you know, that SWAT teams can have very different, um, tactics. Some SWAT teams could probably work, you know, with a, at least a white side, you know, uh, assault team almost seamlessly and, and others, their tactics are, are drastically different, not bad, uh, just different. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so I, I'd say that's probably the, 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 the biggest difference. What, what's when you've, as you said it twice, what's the white side? Oh, um, Is that like vanilla versus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, uh, there's, there's tier one, you know, um, which is, you know, our only two hostage rescue units, you know, the Delta Force and SEAL Team 6. Okay. And then everyone else is white side, you know. And okay. it doesn't matter if you're Rangers, special, you know, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, MARSOC. They're all, they all, they're all the gotcha. same. They just work for a different uh, branch. But they're just white. They're considered, we call them white side or, or vanilla soft. My, my last question for you is, and I didn't email this to you, but I wanted to get your opinion on it because I thought about it. I was doing research for... We're going to, me and my co-host, we're going to do a, an episode on, cons, you know, conspiracies, whether they're true or it was just fun, yeah, you know, yeah. good, good stuff to talk about. And I was doing research on a helicopter that crashed. And, and then I just kept going down the rabbit hole of, I started seeing in, interviews with special operators with mass on and voice change going to the news about, which I didn't know was an issue, but apparently it is, is a silent professional post bin Laden. Um, we're talking about extortion. Yeah. yeah. Where they, uh, well, post bin Laden, 
I guess is when it started the maybe books and movies started coming out and I was watching the extortion uh I was doing research for that because I didn't want I wanted to know what I you know was talking about and I came across some seals that were saying that the silent professional is done and they think it's disgusting and the community's kind of split where you shouldn't be doing that that's not what we do and then the other you know the other community is like I guess fuck it we're gonna write books we're gonna so uh yeah. do podcasts on I'm, I'm uh and i have friends on 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 every on every part of that spectrum um and i i'll say my my opinion on this yeah it does i don't speak for the community i can just speak mm-hmm. i can just speak for me um when it comes to again white side if you're a green beret navy seal um you know you've been to combat and you've uh um you know you've served your country i think you should write a book that's just me personally like you, you know, they don't do anything ultra secret you know they you know they're in combat everyone knows green berets in combat in afghanistan that's that's not a secret um they uh, i think it's good i think it's good for special operations to have um you know books written about them so future green berets can read a book and be like oh that's what you these yeah that's what these guys did learn from that you know that tough day and then go be a green beret yeah, i mean that's a good point you know take it all the way back to John Wayne and the Green Berets, you know, what he did for the Green Berets back then uh, when that movie came out, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, Charlie Sheen and Navy SEALs. That's, you know, that's, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but no, the recruiting right. went up massively for the Navy SEALs when, when, <laughs> when that came out. Uh, but, you know, more, something more recent and um, closer to, you know, not, not so Charlie Sheen like uh, 12 Strong. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you know, the Green Berets riding horses in Afghanistan. Those movies should be written. Those books, or those movies should be, you know, should be shown. Those books should be written. I'm a big advocate of that. So let's switch over to, uh, you know, the other side, um, you know, tier one. I have a problem, me personally, when people say, hey, you know, you, you served in a, you know, on a, you know, in a, in a top secret unit and you can't, you can't talk about it at all. To any extent. Um, that's just not true because you can look at my DD-214. It tells you exactly where I worked. You know, um, you know, the, the, you, it's the, uh, the White House talks about, you know, the unit, you know, when, when operations are performed, we're, we're not, we're not a truly like top secret, you know, unit that, that no one's allowed to talk about or no one knows. The things we do, no one should know exactly how we do it. Even the story that you know that I told about getting shot, there's a lot of things I left out of of capabilities and things that that gave us certain information that I'm I'm just not going to talk about. Even though that's old technology in 2014, just no reason to to talk mm-hmm. about it. So there's there's certain things that shouldn't be told, but um, if you're going to talk about leadership, you know, if you're going to talk about you know, awareness, your background, you should be able to talk about your background or else. Why are you listening to me? What did I do in my lifetime that makes you want to listen to me or you should listen to me? Otherwise I did something. I personally, I feel pretty amazing in life that very few people have had the ability to do. And I just have have to hide it and, you know, come at a cost of what I can do good for the community or how I can provide for my family. I just, I, I, I don't buy that. So I don't think it's what you say. Uh, you know, it, it's what you say and it's how you say it. And the reason you're putting it out. Um, that's a good point. Like culture, it's like history. You know, I never thought about how movies have for the military throughout the generations, throughout the decades have been oh, huge to uh, morale. Yeah. Uh, Top Gun produced more <laughs> fighter pilot and, you know, <laughs> wannabes and, and people listen to the Navy than, and that's a, that I do know is, is a stat, you know? <laughs> It's a good thing. It's yeah. uh, otherwise, you know, special operations. You no, know, if no one wants to grow up to be, you know, a green beret, then it's a volunteer unit. No one's going to come to selection. Well, we have to have these things. You're the outlier because you had no intentions of being any type of like that. And then I know someone should, should someone <laughs> should have, someone should have, someone should have made a movie about green berets in, in, in the late nineties. <laughs> and it could have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I guess. Uh, I mean, I don't really have anything. I'm gonna shoot my shot right now. Extortion seventeen. Was that? Was there anything to that? I'll. Um, don't feel obligated. I said I'm no. I'll, no, I'll, 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 I'll always, you know, speak my mind whether I should or shouldn't. Um, but I'll always, you know, tell you obviously I, I wasn't on that. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that was something I was a part of. However, I did a lot of missions like that. I have, you know, uh, I have friends that you know, uh, over uh, on that side of of the tier one family, you know, that that have talked to me about it. I know this, you know. I've heard some of the, you know, the family say things like, Hey, well, they, they, they pulled off people at the last second, you know, they were, you know, that, that was strange that certain people pulled off and certain people were, were put on nothing strange about that. We, mm-hmm. the manifest changes, you know, all the way into the second, the bird takes off, um, having a manifest change isn't, is an odd, um, excuse me, the, my, my biggest question when it comes to that being a conspiracy so um let's talk about and it's gonna i'll, I'll connect it so you know we're landing on the moon why would we want to fake it although we didn't fake it we land on the moon although we <laughs> why would we want to you know to, to show the other countries we're ahead of them mm-hmm. you know and you know and to show the, the world that uh you know that we have more advanced technology even when we didn't so to have a conspiracy theory there has to be a reason what in the world reason would the government have or need to shoot down its own helicopter? You know, or some people think, well, it was a fake helicopter shot down. They died on something else. It's just, well, I, I, the only, I will say that people have brought it to me is that you're, some of this to you is going to be yeah. like, why do people think like this? But you know, is, uh, a lot of those seals were on the Osama bin Laden raid. Is that correct or no? I don't. I don't want to speak out of. Well, they were. Uh, that's that's not that's not crazy because any, um, they're split up in elements, and if that element was on this raid, it's not weird for that element to be on that helicopter. Yeah, you know I mean, so it's, it's it's almost uh, it it almost be uh, to try to correlate it like hey. All the cops that were on this zone three active shooter, those same cops, you know, disappeared over in, in this zone three incident. Well, yeah, both happened. The same people that worked in zone three, which were on both. So it's not, that's not, that's not odd. Okay. It's, I guess those same people, group of people were on helicopters a lot after that. Well, they, people, I think people would say they knew too much. Here, so I'll, I'll I'll play. This I game. don't want to no, sound no. insulting. I'll, I'll, no, I'll I'll play this game. Yeah. I, I, I actually, yeah, you know, I like. Uh, I'm 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 not those people who just don't like your opinion. So I just call you a name. Uh, like if you don't like someone's opinion, yeah, uh, you know, you better you better have some sort of logic of why it's not right. So I'll. So they knew too much. Well, we admitted that we did the Osama bin Laden raid. We admitted you know where it was. None of that is none of that is um, that I know of um, in conflict. So, what? Well, what do you mean they knew too much? Like, going on the Osama bin Laden raid wasn't something they weren't supposed to know or do. The president came out and said the night of the raid, we we got bin Laden. So there would be no reason to r- remove those people for doing something we wanted them to do and even acknowledge that they did. So, so that that one doesn't hold you know hold water for me either. This is the other thing I'll say about conspiracy theories. And after being in this spook world uh to a degree is and they'll even tell you the the biggest one of the biggest inabilities of a human being is to keep a secret yeah. and that's just a fact so let's just talk about the moon let's just talk, walk back to the moon landing um a moonwalk if you will is that the so you're saying we did this production with like and 300 people making up numbers made the production and Every one of those people went to their grave without ever telling another soul, "Hey, I, I was, I was on the fake production. I, ha- I have proof." No, how, no way. Same thing with the nine eleven. You know, the twin towers been inside deal. You're telling me the thousands of people it would have taken to pull that off. No one's come out and and felt bad about it and came mm-hmm. out and said it. No way. Or on their deathbed when on they have their deathbed. That's yeah. right. So. 
the problem with some of these conspiracy theories, especially when, to me, when you don't have a good, like, reason of why it would be, you know, there's no reason that the government should have wanted to remove these guys. You can have your, like, they knew too much. That's so vague. You why know? they? Why they? Dump I, them? I I know too much. You know what's going after me? <laughs> I, so so would argue that. My wife would argue that. Uh, but, Check out. <laughs> but anyway, you know. And so this happened, and no one felt bad that they killed. You know, some of the you know some some of the Navy SEALs that pulled off one of the greatest raids, you know, uh, of high value targets ever for our country. And feels bad that we killed him, and no one's going to come forward and and say, "Oh, I have a, I feel horrible. I have a secret to tell you what the government did." It's just not doesn't pass the common sense yeah. test to me. I, I do not. I also truly believe that there's you can't get one person to hold a secret. You can't tell someone, "Hey, man, don't ever say anything," because that yeah. one human being, that nature is to go. That's yeah. what I just heard. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah the, the the two the 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 two greatest things you know for for a person is being told a secret. And telling that secret. And that's just a human fact. Yep. So that's the, that's the, am I saying there are no government conspiracy theories out there? Um, I used to think there were a lot less until recently. Uh, <laughs> there are some things I can't explain, but, but extortion, 9-11, Katrina, Navy SEALs didn't blow up the, you know, the dam for Katrina. These, <laughs> these are, these are, these are, these are easy ones for me. Not a conspiracy theory, you know, not, not an inside job. Cool. And, uh, who found Saddam Hussein first cab or the unit? <laughs> <laughs> the unit. Uh, I, I, I'm, I may know that one. Um, I, I, that's all I have for you, man. Uh, again, I really appreciate you coming on. That was really fun. Uh, a lot of good insight. I learned a lot just by sitting here with you. Um, do you have anything else that you want to address that we might have forgotten about? That was a little... No, uh, you know, I, I I assume you were you know uh, you were going to talk about mental health. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm I'm glad I, you know, I got to talk about that EMS, the first responders uh, in general. I, I I enjoyed it. To be honest with you, I'm sure from the other podcasts, you know, we we talked a, bit, a little bit more openly and uh, and dove into some areas. So I I, I enjoyed it. Um, do you have? Do you guys have? It's on my fridge mm-hmm. from the thing when I bought the shirt. But do you guys have a promo code for anybody that's a first time buyer for the first? Uh, we have a we have a, a general promo code that I'll give out. FRCC ten gets you ten percent off. Um, uh, you can't combine them. Uh, I've here's something I haven't told anyone else. Uh, you could also use the free shipping code, which is Navy sucks, all one word. <laughs> that actually is a promo code that works. Uh, uh, the backstory is. Uh, one of my Navy SEAL friends, you know, wanted to buy some coffee from me, and I uh, said, "Oh, I'll give you free shipping." He goes, "Oh yeah." And I said, here's the promo code just yeah. to make them type in that promo code. I haven't taken that promo code down. So you can still use Navy sucks to get a uh, free shipping. Awesome. All right. <laughs> First responders, <laughs> coffee company. Uh, I, I will say this. Um, the more than likely uh, by the time this airs, I can tell you uh, by late February, we have two new products coming out that I'm pretty excited about. Um, one is a nurse bag. Um, to uh, to say thanks to nurses and, and everything they do uh, day in, day out. Part of those funds will go to the American uh, Nurses Foundation. And so the second one we have that I'm really excited about is which is kind of called a tactical bag. And this this bag will it shows tactical officers uh, on the front of it. Um, and uh, we're calling it the Tier 1 Blend as a, from Not of the Hat, from the owner of the company. Um, and actually have, we'll have 50% more caffeine, uh, added into it and it's a really cool bag. Um, and you should, uh, follow us and read the back of it. And there is a, uh, a surprise on the bottom of that bag. So those are, those are some new products we have coming out. That'll, that'll reach a, uh, a new you know, kind of customer base, uh, for us and hopefully get it to where we're profitable. And by profitable, I mean, allows us to to give back because that's what profitable is to us yeah all right i'll put the the link in the description for uh first responders coffee company and uh yeah i appreciate it man absolutely good time yeah thanks for having me